Thanks very much, Lord. Okay, the last presenter, um, Dr. Eva Polonska, lecturer with um, Monash European and EU Centre, is presenting on communicating the European Union to Australia, the EU communication strategy and its reception down under. Thank you so much. Uh, are we having a meeting afterwards, or can I speak as long as I want? Um, <laughs> 15 minutes. <laughs> we'll have a research projects and I was sitting upstairs chopping, dropping, cutting, just to squeeze everything as much as I could, but there's still a lot to say. The first project is the one that we conducted together with uh, Shen, say hello, <laughs> I'll explain in a minute, um, how Europe is, how the EU is seen in the, through the eyes of uh, Australasia, in 10 countries in Asia, Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, as part of Asia, and the other project will be about what Europe itself is doing to communicate itself to those countries in the region and why is uh, the outcome the way it is. So the first project uh, took part um, in all sorts of countries, the ones that are in red. I'm talking about uh, Australia and New Zealand, trying to compare some data with, with the Chinese data. Um, it was done with all sorts of partners in 10 countries across the region. Here at Monash, there were two people responsible for it. It was me and Patrick, the one who some of you might have seen this morning. Policy. So there were two of us, and we compared the data that we received this time in 2011 and 12 to the data that was achieved earlier in 2005. And I believe somewhere it was done at your university, Ms. Katina, who was responsible for this back then. People were basically reading newspapers, watching television, and getting paid for looking at what exactly is being said and shown about the European Union. So back then in 2005, if we look at Australia, if there were only four countries compared. What was the picture? Mostly, mostly neutral and EU was portrayed as, as a political actor. What was the context? Context was um, political because it was straight after the enlargement and enlargement was seen as a political issue, not so much economic. Uh, and those of you who know what it was about, it was about admitting new countries and they had to meet certain criteria. Those criteria were political, they had to um, have democracy, human rights, all sorts of things like that. This is not about trade, this is not about economics. So mostly those issues were reported on and it was back then the conclusion was made. Uh, EU was seen as a political actor and shown in a neutral light, more than in a negative or anything else. We were asked to explore a little bit of a context before we embarked on the second part of the project and we looked at what were the politicians saying and doing with regards to the EU. So when the first part of the project was done, um, John Howard was in charge. He didn't like, uh, he, he personally believed that it was a mistake to see all of Australia's relations with major countries of the continent through Brussels. He was a state-to-state -state person. He did not accept, can I say accept? The fact that Europe was, Europe was integrating, he saw Australia as a victim of the, of the world trading system and Europe was, of course, to blame for what was happening with, with agriculture. Um, we mentioned of education today that it's important to introduce uh, some novelties, what's happening in Europe into education. Perhaps, yes, because uh, if you're a leader of the country and you go to Brussels uh, talking to Germany, for example, which happened to John Howard, he wanted to lobby Germany for something to do with the <coughs> policy. <laughs> and Chancellor Schneider told him publicly in front of the journalists that this is not the address where you should be addressing this. This is uh, not us, this is the French people, and besides, this is not Paris anymore that this where this policy is being established. So for such reasons, maybe if you want to get something done for your country, just find out where you, where, who you talk to about this issue. There, were, there was a number of sticking uh, problems with the EU that the EU didn't like back then. For example, the reduction of greenhouse house gas emissions, uh, Howard didn't like such a thing. Climate change was a problem. Uh, Australia's um, record of, of human rights was not, not good back then. And those things have changed with, the, with, with another leader who okay? came, who saw Australia. <laughs> Um, the next leader who came um, had very international perspective. He was a diplomat speaking foreign languages. Um, 
the first move he did was uh, he ratified the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, he apologized to the Aboriginal people, which were perceived internationally, and the relationship with Europe moved beyond just the, the common agricultural policy. It went into other areas that we mentioned, that a number of people mentioned before. It went into security, climate, education, new areas opened. So the relationship expanded, right? Um, if we look at the dates, where exactly he went on his uh, first international visit, it was to Brussels, not as every other leader to London before. And even what, what media reported and what he talked about with the Queen was about Australia becoming a republic. So basically, he wanted to find a woman for a job. <laughs> Uh, Julia came, she continued, um, also went to Europe, to Brussels for the first international visit. She uh, joined ASEM and um, she wanted now uh, the treaty that we discussed is underway, right? So, this is when we start doing the second part of the project, uh, start observing what we are saying about Australia. And we are thinking that because the political climate is getting pro European, it's getting warmer towards Europe, we're going to find out some interesting and maybe good things about Europe. What do we look at? We look at three newspapers and one television and news bulletin in Australia for half a year between January and June 2011. Um, then 1,000 respondents get, um, get asked about a number of questions. I'll not be talking about them. I'll be talking about media perceptions. And then we go and harass a number of people who are obtaining interviews from them. We talk to political leaders, we talk to economic business people, we talk to civil society and media professionals, media journalists and, and senior editors from Australian newspapers. So I'll be drawing on the media content and on the interviews, but only from the, from the media sector. Which newspapers? In Australia, it's the Australian Herald Sun, Melbourne-based, the Australian Financial Review, and we watch um, news on ABC at 7 o'clock every day. We find a great invisibility of the European Union, both in media, in, paper, in press, media, and television. When we compare it to China, it's uh, whoever, whatever country we compare it to, it was the lowest in Australia. If this time we compared it to other countries, what was reported, no, no, what, how many stories got to be printed well, in, in newspapers? When you on the United States, China, and India, and if I wanted to put it on the same slide, we would go a few floors higher with regards to the US and then China, for example. Europe would very little. But we know it's not about the quantity, it's the quality that counts. So we also looked at the stories, how they talk about Europe, what they portrayed about Europe. Um, not much, because majority, the biggest chunk of the stories were mentioning the EU in passing, very minor fo focus of on, on, the, on the European Union in, in all three countries. In this case, what did they talk about? Mainly about economic issues. The yellow color says that in all three countries, it was the economics that was being portrayed, and the orange color is politics. What about economics? State of economy, European market collapsing. It was at the time of crisis. Uh, it was all about the crisis, nothing else. Almost 90% of stories were about crisis. When I looked at this in Australia, it was of no surprise because crisis was happening. We could not pretend that there is something else going on. Or could be, because when we reviewed all the results from other countries, it happened, that, for example, in China. I'm sure the journalists also saw the crisis, yet what they were talking about was not just crisis alone. So we know that Europe is doing much more than just collapsing, falling <laughs> apart. And yes, that, this was the language used. We were asked to look for metaphors, how the journalists were in what way, how were they talking about the EU? And the language was very rich. Um, it was the language of sinking, disease, and falling apart, yes. We could not compare that aspect uh, across the countries because, for example, in many Asian languages, there are no metaphors. So the girl from Korea, for example, asked me, well, what's a metaphor? So we could not uh, see whether they, this is how they described Europe. In terms of politics, it was the Arab Spring going on back then. We found a number of stories, yet those stories were not even talking about what the EU was doing. They were asking, why is the EU not doing anything? So we have to pick them because they mentioned the EU, that's why we were looking for them. But they were not saying anything about the EU, they were demanding EU's action that was not clearly not present, not visible back then. Pictures, the only ones we found back then was the troubled face of Greece, the Eurotrash, 
and a whole lot of prices. And these were the only pictures we found in Australian newspapers. And again, this was not the same story in all other countries. So how do we explain that Australian media portray just crisis and just in a negative way and not everyone else? Because it was across 10 countries, not, not just in Australia. So to find out what it is that EU is doing, we went to Brussels to talk to people responsible for communication, uh, for contacts with media, what it is that they have on offer, what is it, how are they attracting people, how are they make it easy to, for, for journalists to understand what the EU is, what the EU does, so they go back home and write a story. Uh, it's problematic because EU is such an, such an animal that is not a usual thing, right? When we look at international communication, it's usually a state-to-state -state exercise. We have a face that usually represents a country, we have media that a country has, like for example ABC, BBC, when they speak, we know whose message they are telling, or who, whose message they are portraying, they are, they are showing, right? With the EU, it's a different story, it's a new thing, so it was problematic. But then, the most common face in the Australian media were the two women. So, we, I come from Poland, we have this saying that if you want to get things done, you send a woman. So, we <laughs> discovered that Europe thinks the same. <laughs> they got themselves a woman on board, who is now the face of Europe. We got values, we've got messages to be portrayed, we spoke to people who told us, we want to be portrayed as the largest trading bloc. We are the, the largest economic power in the world. We are the largest donor of international aid. We are a trade break blazer when it comes to climate action. We have ambitious targets when it comes to energy. So this is what should be said to the world. Probably yes, if we arrange it into different uh, categories, political, diplomatic, economic, we will see a lot of, let's call it good stuff that Europe is doing and promoting and has considered considerable achievements in those areas, because we cannot deny that Europe is doing a lot in the area of human rights, rule of law. We know it. It's just we don't see it in the newspapers, right? No, none of the newspapers ever mentioned something to do with democracy, human rights, or, or development aid, or anything that Europe is doing well. <laughs> so, we have the message, we have the face, and do we have tools? promote the face and the message. Yes, we do, because over the years Europe has produced quite a lot. We have the website, we have Europe Direct, it's a phone, um, what do you call phone? A place where you call and ask things, personal, call center, something like this. We have European audiovisual service, Europe by satellite, pictures delivered to television footage, delivered by for free to television across the world. Yet the problem is we do not People in Australia, media in Australia, do not access them, do not use them. They don't even know about them because we ask all of them, whoever we spoke to, with whom we asked them, they didn't know they existed. So um, we ask the institutions about the presence of Australian journalists. Now we know that there is one journalist. <laughs> then you're making history and you're not telling anyone. <laughs> but then they went and they checked. There was um, lots of journalists from China, from Japan, from four or five away countries, and Chinese people media where, for example, we have downloaders, I'll say it again, free content, free footage, not the case with Australia. So in Australia, it's down to the, with the delegation, actually, because half of the respondents we talk here, we, talk, we spoke to in Australia, they were familiar with what you do, and they said that they, they actually got informed by you. So well done. I know that <laughs> you have a very small amount of people working on it. None of the other tools reach Australia. So if you could draw a map of, of European communication strategy, it doesn't reach further beyond European neighborhood. So in a way there's something going on, like some other pirates probably capturing the messages flying from, from Europe to, to Australia. The messages do not go further. The only message that we, we just learned is the crisis. Is the face visible in Australia? Like blue? It's the, as you mentioned before, it's national leaders speaking if in, in, in articles, in stories, on the EU, so it's local usually. Um, Trisha was in charge of the uh, European Bank, and because it was about the crisis, he got quoted sometimes. So these are the national leaders. If we look at China, we can see that European EU leaders are more visible than anyone, anyone else. But again, it's Merkel who leads. 
So we need to come down to the point that it's girls who rock, right? <laughs> Australian media experience, we talked to them, why is it the case? They told us, yes, we have all the resources of the major British and American newspapers. We have a, contact, a contract both with The Guardian and The Daily Telegraph, and we are entitled to republish and reprint everything what they print. <coughs> they perhaps have a British-centric perspective, but I think The Guardian is a fine newspaper, so I don't know that their analysis and perceptions of Europe are biased. So this was the person who was in charge of three newspapers, Sydney-based, Canberra-based, and the HK in Melbourne. So some of the stories were really reprinted. They were saying something what EU did and what it meant for the UK. And I was thinking, why is it in the Australian newspaper? What does it mean? There was not inter interpretation or any explanation of why is it in an Australian newspaper. Um, what else? Um, other journalists, I think there is a sense that Europeans are more or less incapable of organizing themselves. We are scratching our heads wondering how to explain everything. So there was another person from ABC News in Victoria. Um, it's hard to keep explaining why the EU is having all those meetings and nothing is being delivered, supplied. Um, ABC News 24. Is it hard to sell your five last minute? No, I'm not That's over. <laughs> um, so I have to finish with this. Um, it wasn't hard at all for them to sell Europe because it sold itself. So in, in the whole process of finding out why it is that the crisis is the only thing being sold to Australians, I think we found out more about the Australian media industry than, than about the EU. That, that would be my very sad conclusion, because all the branding that Europe wants to get promoted is absolutely not visible in Australian media, which is not the case in other countries in Asia Pacific. So that's, that's the only surprise I Thank you.